Alright, another draft science video presentation. Uh, some more on energy transfers, how things acquire velocity, um, the kinetic energy formula, which is, I'm arguing, <laughs> you know, I certainly am making the argument, uh, no reasonable counter argument yet, um, that, um, the formula is a nonsense. Um, there's only one formula to define something's energy or capacity to do work, and that is its momentum. That's the truth, that's the origin, that's the mechanism. So we'll deal with a couple of comments, and that should be enough ground to uh, provide explanation from, and um, illustration of the point. So the three-letter acronym guy has a new name, I guess, PSB. I don't want a number. Use variables F, M, T, 2 if you want. Why would I want to? I'm sort of making the argument that your formulizations aren't nearly as good as drawings or real models. Like if I could draw something, I can illustrate its proportions exactly. I can make a little model of a car. I can make a little model of a space shuttle. And it's useful. Now, it's not the same thing, but for certain experiments, it's perfectly suitable to use models. And you're using math models. You think math models gets to the truth. And I'm arguing that, no, it really doesn't um, in a lot of cases. And um, especially in this case, your mathematical model completely failed you, okay? <laughs> Dismally failed you because you think everything works by the same mathematical model. And the whole point is, is none of it works by the same model. Okay, if it, all the different ways I can apply force to something, they're, they're all have their own variables, their own nuances, their own tricks. Um, breaking a piece of wood, you know. We already know that one too. Everybody kind of knows this idea that you can snap something by applying uh, enough force quickly and you will end up applying less force than if you try to slowly bend it and break it. You know, the whole karate thing. You know, if you hit the board quickly enough, you snap it and you use very little energy, whereas if you try to compress it and smash it, you know, with slow compression, you'll use much more energy and might not even successfully be able to accomplish the task. How you spread a force makes a huge difference. I have it in the shape of an arrow, huge difference the shape of a basketball um, <clears throat> or a flat piece of anything <laughs> okay I spread the force I don't spread the force so many nuances and you say you're just gonna write a formula and that'll explain everything on earth well it doesn't plainly so F M and T 2 are useless I mean T time is useless in a lot of cases because in a lot of cases the transfer is very quick and T is not really relevant. Um, and so you're saying it's all about mass, <laughs> you know, essentially. Right, you're using T2 as some sort of velocity, um, so why not just put velocity in instead? Because it's a real quantity. It's a real thing. Things have velocity. They have momentum. So, you know, we can understand that they have velocity. You don't even put velocity in there as one of the choices. So obviously, it gen it's a generality, if I was going to write this equation, I'd say, yes, F equals M times the velocity times some factor, okay, for a constant that will be, say, the th thickness of a board. And then you have to have another constant, which is, but, you know, if you hit it at above 50 miles an hour, it snaps the board, and so there's a different quotient. So now you have to have another catch somewhere in your formula to say, well, below 50 miles an hour, it's a lot more friction than above 50 miles an hour. You could understand that, right? If I had a if I had a vehicle going down a track and just put boards in the way, you can kind of know that when it's going over 50 miles an hour, it snaps all the boards, and uses up very little energy, and then when it starts going below 50 miles an hour, all of a sudden the boards start bending and bending and bending, and now they're putting up much more resistance to the motion and applying a lot more force against the motion. Uh, I gave the spring example. Springs aren't perfect, so springs, the deeper you go into the spring, the more it compresses, the more it pushes back. Same thing with a magnet. Um, you know, the deeper you go in, the more it pushes back. So, you know, none of this is 
useful in my opinion okay it's your god the mathematics it's not my god all right you say i should feel perfectly comfortable just creating some generic formula that fits all circumstances i'm saying that's just why you got into this mess in the first place is trying to have some universal formula to describe how force is transferred between objects what force is is the more important question and again you think it is gravity do you think gravity is the way you define all forces? Because that's all the momentum formula has anything to do with. That's why the one half is in there. So, yeah, oh God. This really hasn't been a problem for a, a few weeks. Anyway, so let's go over this. We'll uh, attempt to illustrate. Um, so using the, the, you know, taking the formula, what, what, is, what do we see in it? Okay, and uh, you know, what are we? What are the giveaways? Well, the squared thing looks a lot like the inverse square law. So that has to do with the fact that gravity gets stronger. You know, it gets four times weaker as you go four times the two, twice the distance. So that's sort of a giveaway that that's where this came from. But where did this come from? Well, this comes from the fact that when you accelerate in gravity, okay, when you fall in gravity. You're being pushed at a certain rate, okay? We'll make it 22, I'm gonna make it miles per hour, <laughs> okay? It's the hell with this meters crap. And so you're gonna fall at this rate of 22 miles an hour overall. But the truth is in the first second of time, um, you're not gonna go 22 miles. You're only gonna go t 11 miles. So. In the first second, all you did was 11 miles. You didn't go 22 miles an hour. But the fact is, is that now you are going 22 miles an hour here. So you've stored 22 miles an hour of velocity. So in the next second, you're gonna be going 22 miles an hour plus, okay, the extra, you're gonna go another 11, um, 11 miles an hour in distance, 11 miles. So you're gonna go another 11 miles plus the 22, in this second right and that just keeps adding up so each time gra each second gravity only gives you 11 miles an hour the gravity itself only gives you 11 miles okay but your velocity you know gives you velocity gives you extra that is always going to be it's going to be a much longer line the stored velocity you're gaining means you're going to travel a lot more distance in the fourth second than you traveled in the first second a lot more distance and so there's a huge bias built into here but anyway so that's the half the half just means that okay gravity it rule works by this rule okay you're in you're in for one second it only gives you one half the distance it's supposed to it's supposed to give you 22 miles you know if this was a second um and it doesn't it gives you one half of that so that's what this half is from so <laughs> just saying you're just telling me that all force okay all force equations should be gravitational equations I'm saying no you have to change these variables based on the force you're applying and in a perfect circumstance where you're transferring momentum between two hard objects like in the case of steel balls um, in, a, in a Newton's cradle, or in the case of banging a train into a train where you can have very few losses. Um, the fact is, this is all you need. This will tell you all you need to know. There's no, there's no other um, nonsense that you have to add. You don't have to add any constants or any other crap. Um, so you're just misunderstanding that mathematics doesn't solve all problems. Um, and it can't. You can't even formulize it to catch all the circumstances and so you start writing your formula as a programming code so for the subtleties of friction for example there's so many subtleties about the surface and how the surface is actually you know sticking a little rod up and saying I'm gonna steal a little bit of energy you have to think of the surface friction as being something with a you know a bunch of little um, little little uh, um, <sighs> <laughs> sticks or whatever sticking up that are going to say I'm going to take a little bit of your energy but then you have to understand that each one of those sticks has its own rules about how fatigued it is and how this and that so the nuances are are deep and you're pretending oh no there's no nuance 
Now, gravity isn't very nuanced. Gravity does the same thing by the same rules pretty consistently so we can understand it um, more completely. Uh, but you can't just, again, play this game that because you've understood the gravitational force, therefore you've understood all force transitions. That is, all application of force is in the form of gravity. It's not. It's obviously not. <clears throat> So you're just doing crappy physics. You're doing very juvenile, immature, underdeveloped physics. And then you're pretending with this arrogance that you have something solid and, and um, you know, rational. And it's just like quantum mechanics. It's completely irrational. You're, you're, you know, just to understand quantum computing, quantum cryptography, all of these things are saying that I can make, I can make stuff that's supposed to be canceled by any interaction with the universe. So if the universe does anything to the thing, it's caused a, a you know, catastrophic uh, reveal. And whatever the thing is can no longer be superimposed. And so you're supposed to believe that all through the space that all this stuff travels, it never encounters another piece of force, another piece of gravity, another piece of something that's going to in some way reveal what it is. Not a single atom. It's nonsense. You, you, know, you just believe in nonsense. Not my fault. You're bad. Okay? So, uh, Bob, I think, posts a couple of comments. Yeah. Should the experiment be done in a vacuum? Now it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, to remove friction or the actual effect of friction too small to affect the experiment? Yes, too small would be the simple answer. Uh, Zohar said you can probably get decent results without doing it in a vacuum. The only time you got to worry about the atmosphere is when you get up to terminal velocity, and that way you would be eliminating the velocity equality, so to speak, by the fact that you can't make certain objects go any faster because the atmosphere was going to stop them from going any faster, so therefore your energy is not going to be in the velocity, and you can't change the mass, so therefore you're not going to see the extra energy. Um, <clears throat> you just need a decent spring to record collision. Two trains block wheels properly weighted. Yeah, obviously you don't need trains. You don't need a track. <laughs> you just need two objects of you know reliable mass. And you don't care if you're losing a couple of percentages here or there. We're just really arguing about twice the energy. Again, their argument is the object has twice as much energy. It should be really easy to um, demonstrate that within 98 <laughs> percent, um, you know, within a two percent error, you can demonstrate that they have the same energy. All right. Um, do all uh, nucleuses have uniform effect on the magnitude of the velocity? So this is the more complex argument that I started in terms of how velocity is stored in matter, and it's. Um, it's really important, but <laughs> you know it's not the part that is well understood even by me yet entirely. But I'll give you a I'll give you an outline. Each nucleus has an uh, an unchanging push in the direction, and the only effect forces and only effect forces like gravity have and only effect forces like gravity have is altering the direction of these nucleuses. Well, the point is, is there's mechanisms in matter that allow it to have what's called, what I will call, permanent velocity. That is, durable velocity. That is, they can overcome the drag effect that would be inevitable in the process of moving into ether or moving into a field of force. You have to explain the drag. Uh, if this is the case, would that mean that a given mass has an upper limit to its speed? Well, that's the whole point, that everything has an upper limit, which is the speed of the stuff moving that's pushing it. If you're going as fast as the runner behind you is pushing you, I mean, if I try to go faster than the guy pushing me, or the squirrel in my engine, I have a squirrel running my engine, you know, I can't go faster. I mean, yes, I could use gears and levers and all this kind of stuff to make this, this squirrel's energy. I'm saying if they're pushing from behind, they can't. there's no hope. I can't go faster than the force that's pushing. So if we understand that all the movement is caused by a push, 
all the transfers are caused by pushes that it's all about whatever has the higher pressure imposing on the thing with the lower pressure then you understand that nothing goes faster than the forces that are doing the transferring uh, for reference I'm referring to the part at 46 46 well whatever um, <clears throat> all right, so <clears throat> what I'm arguing is <clears throat> what I'll defend as a theory, okay, of how part of this takes place. And this is just a gross outline. I'm not saying this is the end all finished product of my. I'm just saying that some of the principles I would be quite confident in, some I'm not so sure because, you know, nobody knows. Um, so I gave you a simple description of a mechanism that could create permanent velocity. So if I put a proton and two electrons, or two protons and one electron, the point would be is that in the nucleus, that's what you have. You have twice as many protons as you do uh, electrons. So we could just make that a minus, and you'll get it. Um, and we'll make these little pluses. So these are protons. And if I make this arrangement, and there's a simple rule that says this force that's between the electrons is neutral to protons. And all protons do is turn 90 degrees. So the force, <clears throat> the little ping pong ball, is bouncing through here, back and forth. So these are just ping pong paddles, essentially, and you have a ball that bounces and it just turns when it hits the proton, I mean the electron. And so you can understand that if I had a bunch of those little balls bouncing between these things, that would be creating a pressure. And it would find an equalization because it's attracted to the electron, but it's repelled by this force that's going also through the the the, the, the um, electron and that <clears throat> you can understand that the more I push on it from either side the stronger I make it the more it's going to push back so for any push I incur on it it's going to push back so that therefore now it can overcome drag so there if there's more force coming from one direction it will push back against that force and continue to do what it's doing and what it's doing basically is going this way you can understand that if the force is bouncing between these two objects, and it's this one it's not affecting, it's just turning here, and it's hitting these in this direction, well, you can understand that these two directions would add up to this direction. So this is a little motor. So if you understand that bit, so I would argue that that's consistent with the evidence. The evidence is that helium nucleuses do this. So I can throw a helium nucleus into space and it'll keep going. I can hit the moon with one. If I throw an electron, I can't get it there. I throw a proton, I can't get it there. But if I throw a helium nucleus, I can get it there. Because it can overcome being dragged to a halt. It can overcome the friction of the force. All right, so let's go to an atom. So now we have an atom with the nucleus that has those little things in it. Okay, it has, I won't put an N in there because I'll put an arrow. A triangle, let's say. Let's say a, a triangle <clears throat> like this, so you understand it has a direction. Okay, so the triangle has a direction. And so that's what's inside the nucleus, is, is these triangles. And these triangles add up to a direction. Okay, and the idea is, is right now we're moving through space in some direction, you know, at this moment. So the net, uh, this will be the net triangle. So there's a bunch of these little triangles. One might be going that way, one might be going this way. But their net effect is to be going in one direction. Okay, they add up all the directions and they end up going in one direction as a whole um, thing. And then the catches around that little motor, okay, that has a direction, there's the electron of the atom, the electrons. And the electrons can also have a shape, so they can be perfectly balanced, you know, perfect circle, or they could be in a shape, all right? And if they're in a shape, that means that this will tug one way and the electrons will tug another way. So you can sort of understand that whatever shape the electrons are will decide what shape the nucleus is too, in a sense, or what direction it's going to have. So in a sense, I could argue that if I, <clears throat> if I took some atoms that, let's just say for the sake of argument that we're not moving, all right, that all of us, that all the matter in this area has the same bias, so we'll just call it a nothing as a bias, a shape. But everything has the same bias. 
So I'm not being truthful. This would be what would happen in perfectly still space. See, so yeah, and it doesn't even happen this way because I didn't draw a very good circle. Um, <laughs> that's not too much better. Uh, but anyway, um, so you have a, an atom that's neutral. And let's say some atom that isn't neutral bangs into this one. What's it going to do? It's going to compress it, okay? So my argument is it's going to compress it. And when it compresses it this way, right, it compresses the electrons this way. The electrons, you push in on this one, it means these go out, okay? And, well, this one doesn't do anything for the time being. Well, if those go out, this one goes in because there's less pressure. So it goes towards the proton, so it does go in, okay? So... Now the electrons are in this shape. And when they go in that shape, what does the nucleus do? Well, the nucleus ends up going in this shape, right? <laughs> because now it's feeling that lack of, you know, the extra, yes, yeah, the extra attraction. So it's moving into the electrons because the protons are attracted and it's getting more attractive force. And because these went further away, there's less attractive force, so this can compress. So now your nucleus is in this shape. And let's say the shape of the nucleus is, is connected to the direction of the little bits, okay? So now you've, you've compressed it this way, which is expanded this this way, expanded this this way. So now the nucleus is, has a more bias in this direction. So by hitting it this way, you cause electrons to go that way, and you cause the nucleus to essentially create motion in this direction now, a bias in this direction. So if it was going this way, now it's going to go this way, or it's going to go some direction that's more the way it just got compressed. So compressing atoms gives them a motion bias. And that's why this also explains why, you know, when you run a current through a wire in between a, in a magnetic field, um, the wire pops out is because you're doing this very thing you're compressing atoms and changing their orientation and that's why there's movement in the objects that you create this kind of compression in this electricity um, all right so that's part of that explanation anyway um, but I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> yeah I don't want to connect too many subjects because then it's going to get Less and less uh, easy not to make an error somewhere that uh, creates a lack of continuity. So anyway, so just understanding that basic principle that all you're doing by creating impact is you're changing the shape of atoms. By changing the shape, you're changing the shape of the nucleuses, which means you're changing, you're putting a, you're changing the bias of their direction and creating pressure in a new direction. And the atoms just keep doing that to each other. As they move, they bang into each other. They cause the atom next to it to do the same thing, and then the atom next to it to do the same thing. And that's how the force is transferred. So when two steel balls hit each other, what's really being exchanged, sort of, right? Because the atoms are all in very rigid connection to each other. They're, they're hard substances. Um, what you're basically doing is, is you have a bias in all these nucleuses here, and it's maybe just a tiny percentage. It only might be, you know, 0.0003% of the nucleuses that have that alignment. But there's more aligned this way than there are aligned to that way or aligned that way. And it's, it's a bias. So the net is, is that there's a bias in a direction, but it's not a significant bias because it's far, 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 far short of maximum speed. Maximum speed would be all of them pointing in the same direction. They're far short of that. Anyway, and so it bangs into this other ball, and what's happening is, is so there's order here, in the sense that there's some, you know, um, pattern. And what's going to really just happen is, is through this point is going to be all of that compression stuff is going to happen. And because the atoms are so tightly connected, it's a conductor, and at the speed of electricity, the orientation of this will be transferred to this. That bias will be transferred because what's going to happen is as, it, as you compress, you're doing, going to compress the other ones in the exact opposite direction. So you can sort of understand that when I hit this, when I hit this atom into this atom, what happens is, is there's a transfer. This bias, okay, forces this atom to do this. <clears throat> when it hits, it's going to re orient this atom into this shape. 
So they're going to exchange their shape. The thing that's funny shape, this long this way, is going to become longer back to this shape. And this thing's going to go from being this shape to this shape. So you're transferring the distortion. So the distortions in this that are causing this bias are essentially going to be going this way in terms of being undistorted and the uh, distortion is going to go that way in terms of that's going to spread in here. So that's going to be the process of transfer. Now the trick is also that the speed thing is a real thing. I can't take a slow thing with you know 10 energies you know, pop it into something that has zero energies <clears throat> that's smaller and make the smaller thing go away faster. Okay, so that's part of the reason why, you know, some of these experiments have to be done in one direction because if you try to do them in the other direction, they'll give you a distorted view, right? Because the only, if this has 10 miles an hour, I can only make this go 10 miles an hour and then it goes away from me, right? So if I hit a smaller object, what happens is the smaller object goes the same speed I'm going and as soon as it gets up to that speed, as soon as it starts going 10 miles an hour, right? <laughs> um, I can't hit it anymore. I can't do any more transferring. So as soon as half of my energy gets into this smaller object, it's already going the same speed I am. And as soon as, you know, one, you know half plus, you know, point zero 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 one, as soon as it has a tiny, tiny bit more than half my energy, it's going faster than me. So I can't possibly stay connected to it and I can't give it the rest of my energy. So that's why banging heavy things into light things doesn't get you twice the velocity because it doesn't have time to do that. The thing is already moving away from it before it can add more energy. So this ends up going away at five miles an hour and you know, this is half the mass and this still has half the energy left. So now it's gonna go five miles an hour too. It really just doesn't have a choice. <laughs> you know, it lost half the energy, so it lost half of its its velocity. It never loses any mass, and so you can understand this leaves at five, and this leaves at five. This stays just a tiny percentage right behind the other one, and so you know that's what uh, Descartes figured out. You know, a long time ago. Good, good, solid deducing. Good, solid watch the experiment, try to figure out what's going on. But he didn't really understand the whole idea of the mass transfer. And the fact is, is the reason why you can't transfer it is because once you're, once, once you're, <laughs> once you've given something half your energy that's half your size, that thing now is faster than you are, and you're not going to be able to push it anymore. You know these, you know, but this is elemental to understanding these experiments and what happens. And um, again, I, I, you know. I don't understand why, uh, I mean, this is so fundamental and so elemental to understanding. I just don't understand how people can still say momentum and the idea of kinetic, the kinetic energy formula have any compatibility at all. They're completely opposed to each other as ways of understanding the transfer of energy. They get completely different answers. They tell you completely different things about what energy is. One of them is right and one of them has to be wrong. They cannot coexist. And the evidence for momentum being the real um, reveal of what energy is, the real definition of it, is in my opinion overwhelming. It's so substantive. And all you're doing is playing games with how different forces, um, how, how you can extract energy in different ways that aren't consistent. And, you know, that's just bad physics, you know, plain and simple. It's doing it wrong. And you should stop doing it wrong. All right, just figure I'll add a little bit just to be clearer on gravity if I can be to explain why you can't use gravity as an example of force transfers. It's a unique case. They're all unique cases in a sense. There's no one rule fits all. Um, and so it's just a huge mistake to think Newton's gravitational formula is applied to everything. That F equals MA is... Um, the standard because it isn't <laughs> yeah okay 
Um, so the idea is in gravity, you have this idea where you fall, and you fall only one half the distance here at the first second. And you're still only going to fall one half the distance, but you're collecting velocity. So in the next second, you're going to fall this much. One, you know, that half plus another full unit. So and in the third second, you're going to travel this much larger distance because now you have two units of extra velocity plus you're getting another half. So you're going to be going twice as far as this. Um, and it goes so on and so on. So this line keeps getting longer and longer the longer you fall. So in, so in the first second, you do a tiny amount of distance. The second, bigger, you know, a three worth and the fifth, you know, five worth. It just increases exponentially as you go, as, you, as you're falling. This probably should be seven. Um, so anyway, um, and the same is true going up. So if you're going to sit there and say you're going to measure something's energy, you're going to have to be aware that you can't measure it in just one interval of time. Because if you do that, you're going to get a silly average, right? If you, if you just take this and say this, I'm going to just measure it in one second. I'm just going to take one second worth and say that's its energy. Well, you're going to get a lie because the actual, I mean, the, the amount of compression, the amount of distance you get. Because what you really have to do is take 7 plus 3 plus 1 and then divide that by 3 to get the average. You know, that's going to tell you the real amount of energy. Because this truth is the force is acting, you know, you're collecting it the same way it gave it to you. You're losing it at the same rate. So when you throw something up, it does the same thing. It travels a huge amount of distance the first second. And the last second, the last second, it's only losing this tiny little bit of distance. So it just goes from here to here in the last second. When it went from here to here in the first second, you can sort of understand that's a lousy ruler, right? Where the first inch is this big and the second inch, is, you know, gets bigger and small one and a little tiny, you know, different size inches on the ruler aren't going to do you much good if you're going to take little measurements out of, out of that context. So you always have to understand the context. And the fact is that that's how gravity works. So it's going to give you some some perceptions that aren't going to be accurate, like the idea that get twice the velocity, you have to go four times, you know, the distance. Um, because it's just because of the way you collect the force. <laughs> it's the rules of collection. that um, That's how you collect it, and that's how it takes the energy away from you. So you can understand that it's nothing like a disc brake or something. It's not really... Um, applying this, uh, well, that's the right way. Just it's probably that it probably is in some respects like that because it's the no because it bites harder the slower you're going. So it's in a sense it's a similar because it's relying on the fact that some things with velocity can um, will will take it'll, it'll absorb less energy. But if it truly could absorb the same exact momentum, that is, if you had some like little things you had to knock down, they always gave the same amount of force. They weren't snappable. So you always had to lose the same force by traveling over them. Um, you'd get a very different um, understanding of you know how you collected the force and how velocity isn't going to give you any advantage. You're not going to be able to um, outwit the impediments you're hitting by moving faster through them. They're not coming at a rate. You have to hit them. So if I had obstacles that the, that the object had to go through, and there was a certain number of obstacles per distance, then it doesn't matter how, whether I go through them fast or I go through them very, very slowly, I'm hitting this many obstacles. I'm hitting this many things that will take energy away from me. Gravity is a constant force coming down, raining down on you at a speed. And because of that, if you stand in the rain, you get wetter. If the rain was frozen and you had to actually move into it, okay, then it would be, it would be what you would expect. It would be, you know, half the distance, half the force, twice the distance, twice the force. It would all equal out, but it's not. It's different. It gives a bias to velocity. The faster you go, the less force you'll collect. And so, therefore, you can get rid of these impediments by moving faster. You'll only collect one here, and you only collect... Say this was a unit was you know of energy. You only collect one unit of energy here, and through this whole distance, you only collect one unit of energy here, and that's it. So there's only one impediment 
here and one impediment here, even though you traveled this much longer distance. So that might be a way of understanding it, is you're not getting specific units of energy based on distance. You're getting units of energy based on time in the force. And none of the other forces, frankly, I mean, none of the other mechanical forces where you're involved with crashing trains into trains or cars into cars or other things into other things has anything to do with this. So, um, you yeah, know, so that's a probably good enough, right? You just can't say that F equals <laughs> and universal formula. <laughs> okay, I have a universal formula to tell me exactly how long, how far it travels is the definition of how much energy it has. So the simple example again is you can understand that if I move this quickly, that's a certain amount of energy. But if I move it really slowly, then I'm going to use a lot more energy to lift it. So that common experience should tell you to, to help you understand that the slower I move it, the force keeps hitting. So I keep collecting force. I'm collecting more water in the bucket. So if it was rain, you can understand if I can move the bucket from A to B quicker and then it's out of the rain, the quicker I move it, the less water I'll collect, the less force I collect. So you can't think of this distance as being a, an example of how much total force there is because the distance only matters based on how fast you traversed the distance. The slower you traverse the distance, the more force that you'll collect opposing your movement. I, I've given an example. I mean, it's, I can't see how a reasonable person can't understand. So if you still don't understand, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I could probably make the video a little better, use better analogies, have little stick figures moving around maybe maybe an animation or something but you really should be able to get this because it is in the world you exist in you've got to know that if you move something if you again lifting weight slowly much more work than quick if i hit a board you know and crack it you know these are <laughs> the fact is there's a bias for velocity um in terms of a lot of the sources of friction or the, the opposing forces you are pushing something into, a lot of those opposing forces have a bias to velocity. The faster you go, the less impediment to your travel. You crack the boards. You could almost argue that that sort of happens when a bullet goes through a human being. The faster the bullet goes, the less tissue it hits and interacts with, the less... Um, you know, and it, re it interacts with it in all of it very quickly. So all of it is um, very efficient in terms of transferring the energy, and therefore um, it doesn't slow the bullet down as much, and the bullet can go deeper and deeper. But anyway, I, it's, that's a, probably a, not a perfect analogy. But whatever. It's not about perfection, blah, blah, blah. It's about a simple argument that physics is just making a mistake. Um, by thinking it can say something as simple as F equals MA and say it's described all interactions between objects that contain force are being moved by force. That one formula doesn't say nearly enough to explain all the different ways you can apply a force. Okay, that's that should be the that's the intelligent takeaway. The simpler takeaway is the formula is a piece of crap and it was invented in a silly way. <laughs> it's clearly just a, it's a Frankenstein monster. It's not even made out of proper human parts. <laughs> you know, it's a really bad invention invented under very bad circumstances and it's crap and you should grow over it. Grow up past it. Uh, accept the truth. They made it, that's another example of a catastrophic mistake that physics just couldn't care less about. All right. So, until the next time, and such. It's just so bad. <laughs> I, have to, I shouldn't have to do this. Uh, you shouldn't be this stupid. There's just no reason for you to be this stupid. Oh, yeah, I should do that. Uh, all right, so this has been a draft science video presentation and such.